All right, we're in chapter four of The Physics of Heaven by Judy Franklin and Ellen Davis, going through this one chapter at a time without reading any chapter before it and just seeing what it says. How does it compare to scripture? And are the claims of the book true? So the little excerpt on the side of chapter four says the following. From the point of view of quantum physics, as human beings, we are not only immersed in energy fields, but our bodies and our minds are energy fields. Researchers are now studying ways to work with the body's energy to bring healing. Dr. Oz of TV fame reflected the opinion of many medical professionals when he recently stated, As we get better understanding of how little we know about the body, we begin to realize that the next big frontier in medicine is energy medicine. Of all the doctors in the world that I'd like to take advice from, it would probably not be Dr. Oz. Anyways, she goes on to say, There are many established uses of energy fields in the diagnosis and treatment of disease. And she lists them, which are legitimate. Corrective eye surgery, uh, cardiac pacemakers, radiation therapy, UV light therapies, so on and so forth. Then, she kind of slips in there, there are also fewer re le less research therapies that use energy fields such as music therapy and magnets to increase blood flow and using tuning forks to produce healing sound frequencies like well, yes these are less research however there's a growing interest in unmeasurable energy fields in diagnosis and treatment of disease all right little expert on the side extra thing on the side there and let's move on so this chapter in chapter four is written by bill johnson the lead pastor of Bethel at the beginning of it, just to kind of clarify that everything in this section is written by Bill Jemson. It was taken from excerpts from his teaching on spiritual inheritance, and it was adopted for the book with the permission of Bill Johnson. So he's got his stamp of approval on what is written here. Um, he's the leader of Bethel, and I don't, I don't know if he teaches in the School of Supernatural Ministries or not, but it is a ministry under his church's umbrella. So he has kind of given his stamp of approval of this book, I would believe. This is the foreword saying, while this chapter isn't about sound, vibrations, or frequencies, we wanted to put Bill's teachings on recovering our spiritual inheritance in this book and talking about taking things forward and how the enemy fills that void if we don't take things forward and an emphasis on recovering God's lost truths as an inheritance for future generations of Christians. Okay, so let's see what Bill says, and I'm going to just read some parts of this book and, and discuss it. So here we go. We jump in, and, and Bill's talking about laying up spiritual inheritance for future generations. And as any pastor would do, he compares this to a normal inheritance and kind of gives some stories to it. As a, as a normal parent, you want to give your an inheritance to your kids. You want to leave them with money or a house or something. He quotes Proverbs that says that's a positive thing to do. So we should leave an inheritance and it allows you to start out ahead. There's positive things about gaining inheritance. You're letting somebody stand up uh, with a leg that you didn't have. Then he says, there's a spiritual inheritance that works the same way. It enables us to start our Christian life at a spiritual level that might not have take that would have taken us years to reach. Another generation's ceiling in God can become our spiritual floor. So we're going to see if he's able to back up this claim. So we all agree that there's an inheritance, a physical inheritance, and we would agree that that's a positive good thing to leave to your children, and that's great. Take care of your family that way. Now he's asserting that there's that in the same way there is a spiritual inheritance. So we're going to need some scriptural backing on this, that this is a true concept that scripture teaches. So let's see what he says. He said, however, this seldom happens when it comes to the spiritual inheritance. And the tragic rest of history is there's no revival that took a priority to leave a spiritual inheritance. He goes on to kind of explain there's all this God stuff that happened throughout history and revivals, but... It would be one generation, and then the next one would forget about it. And then by the third generation, they'd kind of reinvent the wheel. And so he says there are, there are anointings and mantles, revelations and mysteries that have lain unclaimed, literally where they were left, because the generation that walked in them never passed them on. And I believe it's possible, I'm talking, I'm reading as Bill, Bill believes it's possible for us to recover the realms of anointing, realms of insight, 
realms of God that have been un unintended for decades simply by choosing to reclaim and perpetuate them for future generations. Okay, so again, I'm still waiting for the I'm waiting for the scripture or the reasoning behind this being true. He's saying it. He's putting this out there that he believes that of the spiritual inheritance is a reality. So let's see the scripture that he's using for it. Here he goes, Deuteronomy chapter 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. This passage is amazing. It says the secret things belong to the, the Lord. Yet, in the New Testament, Jesus says, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the secrets of the kingdom. Okay, let's pause here and be good Bible students and go to Deuteronomy 29, 29 and look at the context of what's being said there and make sure everything's up, up, up in line with that. So in Deuteronomy 29, uh, Moses is with the people in Moab and he's reestablishing the covenant with them that God had made with them. And he's telling them that they're about to go inherit the land and that they lived in the land of Egypt and all this stuff that happened. And he reminds them of the whole story. And he gives them this warning near the end of it. And he says, in the same way that the other nations will be, were judged, they too will be judged if they go and serve other gods. And he explains it, that, that the Lord, why has the Lord done this to this land? What caused the heat of this great anger? So when God's saying, if you go worship other idols, I'm going to judge you. And the people are going to ask, well, why did he judge his own people? He says, the people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord. Verse 25. The Lord God, their fathers, which he made with them and brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went and they served other gods and they worshiped them, the gods of those that they had not known and allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing it up all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them out into another land as they are to this day. Then he says in verse 29, what Bill is quoting, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What is Moses saying here to the people? He's saying that we made a covenant with God, and if we break this covenant, he's going to judge us. And concludes it with saying that we need to follow his statutes, do the right thing, and the secrets are to God, but what he's revealed to us, this is what we're going to do. We're going to follow the law. So that's what we know. The, the emphasis is on the following the law part. It's not necessarily on finding the secrets or the mystery. It's saying we've been we've gotten revealed what we need to know. And what we need to know is that this law is here before us. This is what we're supposed to do. And the people agreed to that. So the context is pretty clear. And I think the passage is pretty clear that that's what he's saying. Now, what does Bill say with this? He says right after, the, after he quotes this passage, that this passage is amazing because it says that the secret things belong to the Lord. Yet in the New Testament, Jesus says, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the secrets of the kingdom. Well, here's the problem. Jesus never said that. I, I looked at every translation I could find and parallel verses, and I just I couldn't find this anywhere. In every translation, ESV, NASV, NIV, King James Version, you name it. There's a whole list of translations. I actually put this exact quote in Google, and I could not find any translation that says the following. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the secrets of the kingdom. Here's what it actually says. If you want to look up the context of what it's actually saying, it says, It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Never mention secrets. There's no word secrets in there. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then go into the original Greek, because again, this isn't written in English, it's written in Greek. If you go to the original Greek text and you look in the Greek words, the word secret is not in the text. It doesn't say that. It just says the father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. All right. So again, when I said that we can't build narratives off of false assumptions, it's a false assumption to assume that in the Old Testament, God has this secret thing, and in the New Testament, it's his pleasure to give us the secrets of the kingdom. Well, okay. And now I kind of agree with this, and here's the whole point. He did reveal the secrets. That He did reveal the mystery. I've said this before. The mystery of the gospel has been revealed. 
We've always known what's been going to happen. God sent prophets that will let us know that Christ would come, and we also know that Christ is coming again. God's not leaving us in the dark. He's not, he's not setting up this mysterious unknown. There's no secrets in the kingdom of God he, that the secrets of the kingdom have been revealed to us. We know what they are, that Gentiles are fellow heirs with Jews. That's what Paul said multiple times. That's the mystery. The mystery is revealed. Again, they're dealing with mystery religions in this time period. And Paul is playing off of those words and saying, but I'm declaring the mystery of the gospel so that it's revealed to everybody. Unfortunately, I don't know if you, I mean, maybe he just unintendedly put secrets in there, but it's not in the Bible. It just says it's that God's pleased to give us the kingdom. Then he goes on to say that Jesus taught in parables not to reveal truth, but to hide truth. And so he's trying to say we need to seek it out and royalty exists. We're royal priests, but we have legal access to hidden things. I'm reading what he's saying. And we begin to pursue the unlocking of those mysteries. God has given us access to the secret realms of science of politics, of business, of creativity in the arts, for example. The realms are opening up right now to the people because they realize their destiny. They realize that God has ordained and given them access to hidden things. I'm having very big issues with this as I did previous chapters. This sounds very mystery religion to me. This sounds like the hidden religions of Gnosticism of the past. Gnosticism means hidden hidden knowledge. The whole concept, Gnosticism was an early church heresy that crept into the church very early on, and it mixed Christianity with mystery religions. And it was telling people, oh, in order to get the real truth, there's a mystery here. Paul even had to deal with it at the beginning. It, it was that early that aspects of Gnosticism were coming. Same with John. John even more was dealing with aspects of Gnosticism that were teaching that Jesus was like a phantom spirit, and he didn't actually wasn't actually feel uh, physical and real. And, and John was like, no, I touched Jesus. I, I put my hands in his, I put my hand on his, the holes in his hands, that which I've seen, I felt, I'm declaring to you. So John makes it a point to actually go against some of these Gnostics teachings. Paul, on the other hand, had to deal with people that called themselves super apostles who were charging money for their wisdom and their information, and they were misleading the Corinthian church. So I get really uncomfortable when people in the church, anybody, starts talking about this hidden thing, this mystery, these realms that we need to explore, that we have secret realms of science and politics. It's like, what are you talking about? What you, where is that in the Bible? Like, where? What would make you come to that conclusion? So far, I don't see anything. <laughs> We're jumping real far, again, on a false, on a false premise that it's God's pleasure to give you secrets of the kingdom which that word's not even there so it's a completely false narrative what secrets i don't know what secrets he's talking about then he says this right after that about the hidden things he says jesus said the things that are revealed are for you and your children forever and that means that once the truth has been revealed to the people of god it is never to be forgotten again unfortunately jesus never said that when you, I mean, Google that exact quote. The things that are revealed are for you and your children forever. Now, what is the thing that comes up in the first five pages? Deuteronomy 29, 29. So unless he believes that you know, Jesus was there in the Old Testament and that's what Jesus said to the Israelites. I mean, okay, yeah, whatever. But <laughs> Jesus never said that. He didn't say that in the New Testament. I'm assuming he's thinking Jesus said that in the New Testament. Jesus never said that. And again, you have to read the context of Deuteronomy 29, which said what? It was about the law. It, it, it literally says at the end of it that we may do all the words of this law. The things are revealed are for you and your children forever that we may do the works of this law. That, that, is, that, that part of the sentence is very important. You can't just ax it out. So what is being revealed to the people of Israel and to their children forever? The law. And guess what? As Christians, we're not under the law anymore. So that passage is irrelevant to us. It would have huge significance to the people it was written to at the time. And it has significance to us to know that God is faithful to his promises. But as a believer under the new covenant, 
that there has no meaning to me anymore. I don't know why he said Jesus said these things. It's not true. Again, he's building it now on another false narrative. So, so far we have two false foundations to prove the point that there is these hidden things and that we're supposed to seek out truth and that truth has been revealed. It's never to be forgotten which I don't get because he's already said in here that people have forgotten it and generations aren't doing it, but maybe he's saying they're not supposed to be like that. Then he talks about revelation. What's the purpose of revelation? He believes that the purpose of revelation is to advance the kingdom of God. He talks about how revelation is better than knowledge because knowledge puffs up and it makes everyone, knowledge in, in itself will make everyone arrogant. Knowledge puffs up. And it equips us to debate with other Christians. Now, I, I agree with that to, to an extent. If you just have knowledge and you're not walking in love and you're not walking in the spirit, you can be a total jerk to people. And that it, honestly, in going through this, is not my heart to be a jerk to the people at Bethel, to the women that wrote this. Like I've said a few times, I think that they love Jesus. I think that they have generally good hearts. I don't think they're purposefully ill-willed false prophets, teachers, and anything like that. I think that they're in error in some of these areas. And so I think it's important, you now if he says to debate with other Christians, yeah, that's okay, that's good. It's called, it's called correcting one another in love. Paul says we're not supposed to judge those outside the church, but we judge those inside the church. We have a standard and we should be following it and we should always test any words that people are giving. We test prophetic words and we make sure that it's according to truth. So just engaging in that doesn't mean that you're in the wrong. But I agree with him. I agree with him that, that knowledge can be, in itself, is dangerous. So he says, but when revelation knowledge and divine encounter, we're in less danger of pride if we have revelation knowledge. Uh, maybe. Sometimes you could argue that you could also have more. And he gives the example of Paul who, when he got an encounter with Jesus, wasn't saying, oh, look how amazing I am, and how could he? Because a divine encounter wouldn't make him puff up. Revelation knowledge that doesn't take us into a divine encounter only makes us more religious. Then he says, Jesus said in John 5, 39-40, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these things which you testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. The scripture is to launch you into an encounter with Christ. And I, I agree with that. I don't have an issue with what he said there, that we should be, as we read scripture, it's for the purpose of a relationship with Christ and growing in our faith. It's not the purpose of puffing up, building up our knowledge. So I have no issue with what Bill is saying here, and I agree with that. He goes on to say, the first reason for revelation is personal transformation. The second reason of is revelation is to enlarge our playing field of our faith. Now, before I get into all the other things, these three points of what he believes the purpose of Revelation are, are his thoughts and opinions. It's not like we have a verse that says these are the three things, these are the three purposes of Revelation, but I don't have issue with that. Here's the second point of what he thinks the purpose of Revelation is, which is that we need to enlarge our playing field of our faith. He says, if you think that Jesus makes people sick, because he has a divine purpose to work in them, then you've got a very small playing field in your faith to work in. Mm. Okay, I think I'm going to have to start breaking with Bill here on this. If you went back and listened to my, my teaching on Christianity and suffering, I think this is a big point where I will, I will not be on the same page with Bethel Church. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more as I, as I read on more from what he says so you can hear what his thoughts are. He says that if, but when you see that Jesus heals because of righteousness, it's the son of righteousness who rises with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.2. You have a wider field of faith. It's out of his righteousness that Jesus vindicates the effect of sin in a world by healing disease and delivering from affliction. You also see that Jesus healed every person who came to him and turned no one away, that he is the exact representation of the Father. It's like, okay, well, this, again, I have to break part with you a little bit because Jesus didn't heal everybody. If we look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, is when Jesus was in his hometown. And what does he say? They took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, only in his hometown is a, and his own household is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. 
So my question would be, is, does Jesus have the power to heal people? Yeah, we would all agree that God has the power. Jesus is God. And he, he can heal people. He can touch anybody he wants. The woman that came up to him and just touched his clothes and she was healed. I mean, at any moment, Jesus has the power to heal. So why didn't these people get healed? There was a guy that struggled with unbelief. And he said, help my unbelief. And that was enough for Jesus to heal his daughter. So that guy wasn't totally having a ton of faith. But these people didn't really have the faith. And so what did Jesus do? He didn't perform miracles there. Every person that came to him with the sickness doesn't mean that he, he didn't turn them away. And at the same time, while Jesus is in Israel healing the sick that are there, which is great, there were still sick people in Africa. There were still sick people in Asia. And not that Jesus turned them away, but they weren't being healed at the time. I think it becomes a bit of a stretch to go, you're again closing your eyes a little bit to everything else that's happening in scripture uh, i agree that jesus did heal people and he healed a ton of people in many instances he went into a village and it says he healed every person of their disease there and i believe jesus fully has the capability to do that 100 percent. but as we look in this next part here's where i think it gets even more wrong he says everything else previous to this was a type and a shadow, which means that you need to challenge any knowledge you have about God that you can't find in the presence of Jesus. Whoa, that is very dangerous. Says who? So Bill and I, I've, I've started to look a little bit more into the theology of Bill Johnson as a person and listen to some of his teachings. And Bill seems to believe that Basically, we should only believe in the character of God of what we see in Jesus Christ on earth, the end. So he even says here that everything previous to this was a type and a shadow. And he believes that means we need to challenge any knowledge you have about God that you cannot find in the person of Jesus. Wait, what are you talking about, Bill? God is, God is not only eternal, he's unchanging. So the God in the Old Testament is the God in the New Testament. The God that let Satan make Job sick is the God in the New Testament. The God that sent she -bear, a she-bear to, to kill 50 kids is the God of the New Testament. The God that, that judged nations and read Lamentations. What happened to the Jewish people, the Jews in Jerusalem, when they were judged by Babylon? As Jeremiah was an eyewitness to the event, he writes lamentations he watched people he watched mothers eat their own children because they were starving he saw them boil and cook their own children because they were that desperate and hungry he he witnessed atrocities of man and god ordained that and he told them that he was going to bring that judgment on that nation because because judah would not repent and they kept worshiping other gods. And God said, if you keep doing this, I'm going to hand you in the hand of the Babylonians. And that's exactly what he did. And the same thing happened to the Israelites with the Assyrians, which was also just as bad. The horrible nature and the torture of the Assyrian people and the Israelites experienced that in the northern kingdom. God ordained that. God ordained the, the, the conquering of different lands. He, he ordained the killing of the Canaanites, people, men, women, and children. They weren't supposed to take the the loot or anything god said don't even touch that stuff you chase the people that's the god of the new testament and the god of the new testament that you have to also understand is when jesus is telling pharisees you whitewashed tombs you vipers i mean he's angry at what the religious leaders of his day were doing and he says strong heavy frustrating like my god the god that i serve the god that is in the bible is unchanging and and there's a there's an aspect of the fear of the lord that we have lost in some churches where we've turned jesus into a hippie and a free love and he wants to just hand out perfection to everybody and everything's going to be great it's just not biblical and like i said before if you listen to my christian suffering message christians suffer they actually we get it worse for 250 years the church suffered as believers they they struggle and so to to make this bold claim that you need to challenge any knowledge you have about god that you can't find in the person of jesus is wrong 
There's a trinity. Three persons in one God. There is a triune aspect of who God is. And I see all aspects in, in complete equality. It's not like Jesus is the nice guy and that God the Father is the bad guy. He's like, no, Jesus is just as mad at sin as God the Father is because he's the perfect representation of God the Father. He flipped tables over in the temple and whipped people. That's my God. Because he's holy and he's righteous and he, he stands for truth and he's loving and merciful and kind. He doesn't want to do that, but he will. And he's going to judge people at the end times. And go read Revelation. Read what Jesus does to the to the people that reject him. The, the, there's a picture of a wine press of those that reject Christ are thrown into a wine press and they're trampled until the blood rises. It's like horrible picture, right, of the judgment of God. You're like, yeah, that's Jesus trampling on people in Revelation. Like, go look at it. So what do you mean when you say that I need to challenge my knowledge that I have about God if I can't find it in the person of Jesus? It goes really way too far. He says everything before that is a type of shadow, but that's not biblical. That's not biblical at all. And I would say that it's a, it's a narrow, false understanding of Christ to think that he's going to run around and heal every person and everything's going to get better and everything will go well in your life. It's just not the case. I'm sorry. It's not what I see in Scripture. So he goes on and finishes this little section with this. I want you to make sure you get this message out of Deuteronomy because it's a, because it sets a stunning precedent throughout Scripture. This is Bill saying this. When truth is given to the church, truth is always to lead to a divine encounter, never to be, be, never to be departed, but to only be built upon. What? Like, again, what do you mean the message of Deuteronomy? He didn't establish anything. He didn't set – he set three – false foundations for the narrative he's trying to give. Deuteronomy does not set a stunning pre precedent of what? God telling the Jews they need to obey his law or they'll be judged if they worship other gods. And Moses saying the mysteries of God are for him, but what he's revealed to us is the law and we're going to follow it. And all of a sudden this is some kind of stunning precedent and that that means that the church needs to dive into mystery religions or, or mysteries and, and and look for new hidden divine encounters so that we can build upon uh, – well, we're going to get into more of it. Truth should always move us forward. This is the next section. He says, when truth came to the early church, it was to increase and be passed to the next generation. It was only meant to go in a forward motion, yet that didn't happen. I don't know why he thinks that that didn't happen because I would say that – Jesus gave us marching orders right from the early church, Matthew 28. Go into all the worlds, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do and obey the things that I taught you. That seemed pretty clear what they were supposed to do, and they did that. And thousands and thousands of people were getting saved. I don't know. I don't want to be too hard on him because I don't, want he, I don't know what he means by that, but he says that it was meant to go moving forward, but it didn't happen. But we have an opportunity in this generation to grab the concept of spiritual inheritance and see the first time in church history what it looks like. We have the opportunity to lay ourselves down for a generation we'll never see so they can build on our ceiling and take it to places where we never had to had time to go. All right. Again, well, he's going to get into it a little bit later. Where is really all this coming from? All of this idea that the church is going to get better and better and better and better and then Christ will return, a lot of this is coming from their eschatology, their end times teaching. So I'll let, I'll let that come a little bit later because we will look into that. Right now he's looking at Luke chapter 11 verse 24 through 26. And this is what Luke says in that section. When an unclean spirit goes out of man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And, fi and finding none, he says, I will return to my house which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. He says, this sounds like a strange passage to throw in the concept of spiritual inheritance. I would say, yep, it does. He goes on, but there's a principle of the kingdom in this passage that is vital for us to understand. And the principle is this. We have the opportunity to recover lost wealth of prior generations that was, and for whatever reason, disregarded. Okay, I have to pause here. All right, again, let's look at the context of Luke 
As good Bible students, Luke 11, what's this? What's going on in Luke chapter 11? Jesus is healing or uh, casting out demons, and the Pharisees come and they say he's cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And we want to see more signs from heaven. But he knows their thoughts, and he says, well, every kingdom that's divided against itself is laid waste. If Satan's divided against Satan, how can I cast out with Beelzebub? If I cast out demons with Beelzebub, then who do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But, verse 20, if it's the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says this, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus is talking about his own authority here, and he's the strong man. that has, is, He's saying, like, look, so how do you think I'm casting these demons out? How, you think I'm casting them out with Beelzebub? I'm not casting them out with them. That, would, that doesn't make any sense. How is Satan's going to just be casting himself out? Of people and dividing his his kingdom that's stupid so how do i cast him out because somebody stronger has to come i'm stronger than these demons yeah they're fully armed to guard his place as well but not when i show up i can overcome him and take away the armor which he trusted and divide his sport and this is what he ends it with 23 whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters now the next verse right after that so he's just been casting out demons and they're accusing him of using demons to cast out demons then the next verse he says whoever, whoever not with me scatters verse 24 when the unclean spirit goes out of a person it passes through the waterless places and seeking rest and finding none it says i will return to my house which i came so what's the house return what's the house uh, in reference to it's talking about the person it comes out of a person it passes through all the places doesn't find and he says i'll return to my house which i came what's the house which it came the person right that's what it's clearly saying in the context. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Why? Because Jesus, it, they cast it out. It's gone. Everything seems to be in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So casting out demons at the end of the day isn't, what is that really going to do? What is it going to do when the, the, the sons of the Jews were... He even says, therefore, they'll be your judges, because he says, if I'm casting out demons by Belgium, by who do your sons cast them out? So there was a practice in in that time period for Jews to try to use some sort of exorcism. You have that experience with the seven sons of Skizba when Paul encounters that, and the seven sons try to they see what Paul's doing, they they try to copy it. You know, he they oh he's casting out people in the name of Jesus. We'll try that. They were using it as an like an incantation or something. Oh, maybe this word Jesus will will work. And when they try it, the demon says, "Paul, I know, or uh, uh, Jesus, I know. Paul, I've heard of, but who are you?" And beats the crap out of them, all seven of them, and they they run out bleeding. If you cast out demons and they actually leave, that's doing nothing. What do you need? You need Jesus. You need Jesus to ultimately be the protector of your heart and of your life. It's not about just getting rid of demons. So again, looking back in that verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And then Jesus gives them the deep spiritual insight to say that not only do I have the authority to cast out demons, but I take the place of where they were if I'm accepted. And warns them that just, just the event of casting out demons doesn't really do anything because they can come back in full force. Okay, I hope that made sense. Go ahead and read the passage yourself. See if what you think I'm saying makes sense in the context of what's just written. All right, let's go back to what Bill says as a result of this. So reading that context, reading that passage, let's see how he is interpreting it. Here we go. He says, there is a principle of the kingdom of God in this passage that is vital for us to understand. And the principle is this. We have the opportunity to recover lost wealth of prior generations that was, for whatever reading, discarded. Wow, I have no clue how he is going to come to that interpretation from this text. So let's see how he explains it, because I have no idea how you can read the passage we just read and conclude what it's saying is that as a church, we can recover lost mysteries and secret knowledge that was to previous generations and, and get that today. All right, here's what he says. 
All I know is that there are realms of God, realms of past triumphs, of victories that the church entered into and that are not present-day experiences. It's a tragedy. Because he said, again, I'm reading Bill's words exactly right here, and now he's trying to quote scripture. He says, it's a tragedy because God said, the things that are revealed are yours and your children's forever. Again, Deuteronomy 29, 29, he forgot to add the last part of that, which is, says, the law, to follow the law, the things that are revealed are yours and your children's forever, which is to obey the works of the law. That's what it says. Again, Moses talking to Jews in the Old Covenant to receive the law, and they're supposed to do that. The thing that was revealed to, th revealed to them was the law, and the thing that was for their children was the law, which is no longer binding on Christians. So again, I don't know how that has anything to do with his point where we have an opportunity to recover spiritual things that were lost in the past. Then he says in Luke 11, 24 through 26, is a picture of a house. A house in scripture can refer to an individual. In this case, it's talking about a person who goes through deliverance, which is correct. A house can refer to a physical house, a house of God where people worship. It also can refer to, refer to an occupation. There are a number of things that it points to throughout Scripture. Let me illustrate it this way. Again, I'm reading exactly his words. Let me illustrate it this way. If the measure of triumph and victory that a person comes into is not maintained, it becomes reoccupied by the enemy. Israel in the Old Testament was given the promised land, and the Lord said, I've got good news, and I've got some bad news. The good news is that it's all yours. The bad news is that if you get it little by little. Then he goes on to talk about how sometimes the enemy has territory and we've got to slowly get it. But let me back up a little bit when he talks about this section right here. So notice when we read the scripture, he's right in the first instance where he says, in this particular reference, it's talking about an individual. But a house can also refer to a physical house. You're like, yes, it can, but it's not talking about that. I hope we're in agreement that it's not talking about that, so that's irrelevant. And then he says, it can also represent a house of God where people worship. Again, sure, a house could represent that, but that passage that you just quoted is not talking about a house of God. It's talking about a person. And then he says it could also refer to an actual occupation. Finally, uh, one more time, it maybe it could, but in that context, it's not talking about an occupation. So all three of those are irrelevant. That house could mean physical, house could mean place of worship, house could mean occupation, or it could mean individual. Yeah, it meant individual in that passage, end of story. We don't even need to conjure up the other things that it could mean. And so then when he says, let me illustrate it this way, this what he's really saying is, let me make up an interpretation that fits my narrative using this passage that has nothing to do with what I'm about to say, which is <laughs> that a person comes into that <laughs> if... If the measure of triumph and victory that a person comes into is not maintained, it can become reoccupied by the enemy. That is not what that passage says. That's not even close to what the passage says. This is what this is throwing ideas into scripture. You're literally like it's totally backwards. It's not taking the word of God and saying, what does the word of God say? And how do I live my life based on what it's saying? This is a clear example of an inserting a belief into the text. You cannot just say, let me illustrate it this way and then make up an interpretation. And that's unfortunately what's happening here. And I'm not seeing any reason to, to take his word for it. So I, we have false foundation after false foundation after false foundation so far to show that we as a church need to go back into time and find that we have, you know, an, a spiritual inheritance from past generations that are hidden somewhere, and we got to go find it. So far, I haven't found anything convincing that that's true. Then he gets into this part right here, and this is where it is explaining where the theology is that he's driving is really coming from. He says this: the advancement is the nature of the kingdom of God. It's always increasing, regardless of circumstance that surrounds you. Never interprets the purpose of the plan of the Lord on earth according to your restricted, small personal experience. We must think in terms of a bigger picture where God's kingdom is constantly advancing. Okay, my question is why? Why do we have to think that way? Here's what he goes on to say. We are all soldiers in an army laying down our lives so that the kingdom of this world would become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Then he quotes Revelation 11.15. Sorry, he doesn't quote it. He just puts the reference there. So in 11, 
15 of Revelation, it just talked about the two witnesses, and there's a lot happening in Revelation. When you talk about the context of Revelation, <laughs> this is a bigger beast to try to explain. So you've got to go through the whole thing, and again, there's multiple interpretations, so I'm going to cut that off. So I'll just look at what he's quoting right here, where it goes into the seven trumpets. So there's these cycles happening in Revelation of one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's this period of like something else happened, and then seven. And then there's seven trumpets or seven bowls or seven thunders that were sealed up. There's this number that's repeating itself. So at this point, we're talking about the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet is about to blow in 1115. And here's what it says. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, let me give you my very short abridged interpretation of Revelation. It's a circular book that's repeating itself in different ways. It's saying the same thing over and over again, and it's an awesome display that shows that God wins. Jesus wins. At the end of the day, that's that's the story. And how it works is it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, break, seven. And at seven, the world ends. And then all of a sudden it repeats itself. One, two, three, four, five, six, there's some kind of break, seven. And again, the world is ending. You're like, wait a second, I thought it already blew up the first time. You're like, nope. And then it goes again, one, two, three, four, five, six, break, seven, and the world ends again. And you go, what is all this? And to me, as I'm looking through it, it's all, it's symbolism of a representation of things that were, it's almost like a physical look at it. It's a spiritual look at it. But again, it's just repeating the narrative over and over. And, and back in that time in the ancient days, it was common to have uh, plays and it, it, it works off this, this apocalyptic literature and you would have plays in the ancient world that would do this, that would have scenes depicting the whole play, and then it would repeat itself. It would be like the next act of the show. And the next act of the show would kind of do the same thing, but it would add some different details or from a different perspective, but it would kind of give the story over again. And that's my personal interpretation of what's happening in Revelation. I'm taking it more symbolically, pretty much as a whole. And so therefore, when I read this particular passage, I'm seeing the end of the world again. This is when Christ returns and the kingdom of the world is, is Christ, right? But how Bill is interpreting this passage is that we're soldiers in an army laying down our lives so that the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our Lord. And in Bill's eschatology, he believes that the church is going to continue to have victory after victory after victory, and more and more people will get saved. There's going to be there, and they keep looking, especially as a church. Bethel is looking for for a revival to happen, where a lot of Christians will come into the faith, or a lot of people will become Christians because of the miraculous. So they look more literally at the two witnesses and and how they're. Uh, have this physical power, and they, they see in Revelation from a more literal perspective how God's going to like have all this miraculous display of power. And so that's what they're looking for. That's what they're hoping for. That's what they're longing for. And so they believe that the church is going to continue to increase and get better and better and better, and that's going to advance. So that's what he's talking about, where he says that the advancement is the nature of the kingdom, and it's always increasing. But this concept is coming from Revelation, and I've said this before in the last chapter. Instead of interpreting things clearly throughout Scripture and using that as a foundation to interpret the unclear, which I would argue that Revelation in, in a lot of ways is, can, can be a little unclear. It's confusing. Uh, there's different perspective. There's a lot of symbolism. It's not as concrete as a letter, for instance, that Paul is writing to the church or a narrative of of Jesus in the Gospels. They're pretty clear. You can read it and, and follow along, but Revelation's a different kind of beast to interpret. But I find that it, it, it seems like we're not just Bethel, but some churches are starting with their eschatology, their end times belief, and then they're going backwards into Scripture, like what we just saw happen, and they're inserting it into very clear passages like Luke chapter 11, where... All of a sudden, a passage about uh, casting out demons becomes about, it, it's like a symbolic illustration of how the church wins and that we get to take mantles from the past. It's like, that's not what it said. What are you talking about? You just made a very clear passage, super unclear. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So I feel like it's backwards reasoning almost in a way. Then he goes on to say, we can begin by recovering secrets, mysteries, mantles, and realms of God that have been banded and ignored for decades, some of them for centuries. All right, see this? See 
do you see where I'm starting to have more and more of a problem? As I keep repeating myself over and over, like this is old mystery religion ideas. This is old Gnosticism. This is constantly seeking for the more when God's already given us what we need. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the marching orders. We know what we're supposed to do. We should pray for the sick. We should tell people about Jesus. We should baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, we don't need more. I don't get it. Like he, Not only did he tell us where we came from, how the planet got here, where sin came from, he, he told us <laughs> that there's an old covenant. He told us there'd be a new covenant. He told us the Holy Spirit would come. The Holy Spirit did come. And then he told us what to do. And then he said he's going to come back. He, I mean, he laid it all out for us. But for some reason, that's not enough. We need, we need to recover secrets and mysteries and mantles and realms of God. And all of a sudden, we start entering into, I'll be honest with you, we start entering into the occult and, and occult practices and the new age. Because again, we kind of, we're taking a pause in this crazy book because it's we're in chapter four. And so this is Bill Johnson, who's not talking about quantum freaking physics and light and energies and sound waves and garbage. And, and these authors are going, to, are going to try to take Bill's words and say, do you see? Do you see what Bill's saying? He's saying we need to recover secrets. He's saying we need to refine the mysteries. He's saying that we have mantles and that there's realm of gods and that they're hidden. And so that's why we need to go into quantum physics and talk about light energies. And you go, what the heck? What are you freaking talking about? How the, how the heck do you get from that to that? <laughs> Where do you see that in scripture? Why on earth would I go into the New Age occult and start practicing that? Now, let me look this up. This is what happened in one of the School of Supernatural Ministries at Bethel Church. Now, they finally came out and very lightly condemned this, very lightly, because they didn't really know what to say and how to do it. And I watched the interview that Bill Johnson had. The people were asking him pointedly because it was a big concern in the church when people heard about it. But as a result of some of these teachings in one of the schools of supernatural ministries, students and some staff were going to the grave sites of past heroes of the faith. So they, you would go to like John Wesley's grave and they were practicing something called grave soaking. And what grave soaking is you lay on the ground or you lay on the grave of the anointed person from the past and you try to soak up their you know, energy or whatever, and try to get the passage from Elijah when, when his, his, or Elisha, sorry, his pupil kind of betrayed him, didn't listen to him, tried to get some money out of him and he died. And so then when Elisha died, he was buried. And later there was a battle that happened and some guy died and they, they threw his dead body in the grave of Elijah and he touched the bones and he came back to life and they go, Oh look, the anointing stayed on him. And so then, yeah, it gets so weird and it gets so like we try to start making theologies out of stuff and saying, oh, maybe their their anointing is still there and we're recovering mysteries and secrets. And so they went there in grave circuit. You know what that is? That is a new age occult practice. It is not a biblical concept at all. And so they were doing that and, and nobody wanted to condemn them. And then it became a big deal. And then they finally were like, yeah, well, what do you, well, you know, it's not like we told them to do that. And I don't want to really want to judge people. They're trying to find God. And it's like, no, dude, that's wrong. What they did was wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. That's occult practices. Anyways, look that up if you want to see more about grave soaking. So, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying Bill is advocating that. I'm not saying that when he said this, he's advocating it. All I'm saying is that as a result of these teachings, we're, some people are taking it to even weirder lengths. Um, I don't think the women in this book are advocating that. Uh, I don't think we'll get there in this. But because of concepts like this, that's where people are coming from. He goes on to say that for someone in this generation to come along and claim them, we need to claim these old ancient things. And you know, this is what God is doing because he's stirring people to write books about redigging the wells. And there are things lying there. There's mysteries to be understood and inheritance to, that are unattained and cared for, and unoccupied. But they're there for the taking. That's like, ugh, whatever. He says this, We have a history of 2,000 years of unusual things. None of them were meant to be lost, but all maintained and all built upon and expanded. I mean, again, says who? So far, I don't see any reason biblically that that's true. Where does it say in the Bible that it's going to get better and better and better and better and better? In the normal text, I'm saying in the in the clear text throughout 
the Gospels, throughout the letters? Where does Paul make this clear assertion that everything will be better? And now, I, I mean, we all want the kingdom of God to come. We all want that to continue to happen. We we all pray for that and strive for that and do that. And I think I think the heart is good to want to do these things. All I'm questioning is, so far, I'm not seeing a strong foundation biblically that's been given to me that I should just take that as true, that they're that every generation is supposed to build on top of each other. I mean, sure, ideally, but everybody's sinful, and so we're all kind of re restarting the process, unfortunately, over again. It gets close to the end. He says, we've been given an inheritance of generations. We've been given an inheritance of hundreds of years of mystics, of Arialists, and those who broke into the realms of the spirits to leave something as an inheritance, and it needs to matter to someone. Discovering the secret things that God has for us has to matter. I believe one of the keys is for us to come to a place where we recover lost mysteries of God, learning how to give honor to those who are, unwill who are willing to sacrifice and make sure those mysteries are reclaimed. Uh, that's kind of it. Kind of ends it there. Again, I kind of say, say, says who? I I think I've made my point from this chapter enough. I I I don't agree fully with what's being said here. I haven't been convinced biblically that this is true. And I think more dangerously, the reason why they included this in this book, the reason why Judy and Ellen included this in this book of the physics of heaven, is because they're trying to use what Bill is saying here about finding the secret realms and that there's realms of secret realms of science and politics and business that we need to find and they're hidden. And they're going to say, oh, you know what that is? It's <laughs> quantum light and sound waves and vibrations and blah 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 do you see this pattern of building and building and building and building off of false foundations it's like false foundation after false foundation you're like this is true so therefore then this is true so therefore this for you know it says in this when when god says that you should tremble that means that could mean vibration you're like yeah but it doesn't you're like, well, I'm going to build on it as if it does mean that. It's like, okay, but you, you can't. And and then this book keeps doing that. Look, we're all going to be tested. And as a teacher myself, I will be judged more severely when I get to heaven. I am right now saying that these things are wrong. And I will be held accountable to God when I get to heaven and do that. Because if these things were right, and, and if what these women said and claimed at the beginning of the book, saying that we believe that everything in this book is true, absolute truth that will help us bring God's kingdom to this earth, and I die and I get to heaven and they were right, and this is 100% absolutely true as they are claiming, I'll be held accountable to that. And I will be judged strictly because I would be leading everyone that's listening to this astray. And that's a very serious thing that I want to, I take very seriously. It's not a light it's not a light thing to condemn teachings and to speak on behalf of God and say that's not true. And so when I when I say things, I really want to make sure that scripture is behind me in what I'm saying. I want to make sure that the foundations of what I'm teaching have solid foundations that can be tested. And I'm I'm always willing to be wrong if somebody shows me hey actually no i did find that verse or here's some other verses that really show it and it's not easy to admit when you're wrong it's not it's it's hard to humble yourself at times but i really am willing to do that but so far what i'm reading here i'm just i'm not only not convinced i'm seeing it as a very as a wrong pattern with some with some unfortunately dangerous teachings of uh, what i think will be good-hearted people that love Jesus and they want to see revival and they want to see people get healed and they want to see Jesus come back and they want to see his kingdom come. And I, and I, like I said, I, I think I'm going to stand with most and most, most of these people in heaven one day. And we'll all, you know, all of us will have our wrongs in some areas, but right now I want to speak truth and I hope that it's being received and loved. I know sometimes I can kind of come across a bit arrogant and feeling like <laughs> I'm laughing <laughs> at some of the stuff that I'm reading here because I find it pretty absurd and ridiculous. But I I don't mean to laugh at the individual. Yeah, you know, if I was talking to Bill Johnson right here, I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to like laugh at his face and say he's I think he's stupid or something. 
I don't think that, but I do think he's wrong uh, in the in these in some of the things that he's putting here. So I'm gonna keep going. How many chapters are left in this thing, man? I'm on chapter four. It feels like it. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing sixteen. <laughs> oh no. Okay, it looks like it ends at sixteen. All right. Next is chapter five. Come join me if you have any questions, thoughts, you disagree with me, feel free to chat. Uh, you know, I love talking about this stuff. Thanks, guys.